My name's Norm Barker, and I'm a professor of pathology and art is applied to medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. And I do all kinds of things, but um, it's interesting that Jim has talked about um, repurposing old equipment or um, an old piece of whatever. Um, and this is kind of my new toy that I've been using for about the last year. And for me, it solves a real problem. And I think you might be interested in it. It's a fairly simple idea. So Jim, how do I go about sharing my screen here? I'm down on the bottom. Let me do, 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 do this. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. And let me turn this PowerPoint on. Okay, um, if you can see everything and that's blown up full and everything like that, here are a couple of my favorite lenses. And this is the stage that I'm gonna be talking about, which is a fairly simple affair. And um, of course, most of you probably have made your living with these lenses for the last, I don't know how many years, but there's a 60 millimeter macro and a 105. And I use several specialized lenses, for example, these two Zeiss Luminars, which come at a focal length of 63 and then a 40 and even a 19 millimeter Nikon uh, macro lens. But here's the kind of work that I'm doing, uh, a lot of fossils. And I always had a problem of keeping things flat and straight. This is a beautiful specimen. When you consider that when you hold these in your hand, this is Aracara marabilis, which is a pine cone. These are from the Jurassic period and they're actually probably about 80 million years old. And when you look at them, the amount of preservation is just incredible. You can actually see seed cones uh, in the pods themselves that are so well preserved. And these are from Patagonia. And of course, when you lay them down and try to photograph them to try to keep everything level is almost impossible. So I just came up with this idea of uh, what I used to use is shims and all kinds of different things to try to keep things straight and level to get the best focus. But I use a lot of fiber optic lighting. So I basically got an old tripod head uh, a large ball head, uh, which is a Linhoff. You can still get them on eBay and things like that. And put together, uh, let's see, a couple of aluminum plates. So it's basically a 3 8 and a 1 quarter 20 on top. And mounted to the plates, you have this thing that you can, here's, for example, this is a little expensive. This is 175 bucks, but just to show you, you can still get these. You can probably get really right stuff, makes a lot of good things. Um, there's several things out there you can make, but one of the nice things about this old Linhoff that I found uh, on a shelf at the office, that probably hadn't been used in 50 years, seriously. It's, they came out in about 1950, but it does a nice job. It's a very solid platform especially for larger, heavier specimens. You could also buy one of these. I bought one of these. It's a small little teeny, I guess, kind of a precious little tripod, but it folds nice and flat. And you can use that to put specimens on and tilt and move in several different positions. Uh, if I bought it to actually photograph things on a very low level, but it works as well. So here's the stage in action. And I have different top plates, uh, one solid bottom plate, but you can create really interesting pictures uh, by just a tilt to get your maximum depth of field. I still do a lot of stitching depending on the specimen and the type of magnification, but uh, the tilting stage has just really saved a lot of time in terms of making sure that your specimen is in the right position. It can rotate around. It's, it's just easy to use and saves a lot of time. I also have bigger pieces for the top, uh, especially when you need to put a specimen underwater, uh, which often fossils, you need to do that to get rid of the shine. But I will say this, if you are borrowing these specimens from someone, make sure that uh, they can go underwater because some things, even though they're fossils and they've been petrified, they can actually dissolve if the water hits them. So I would test the little area first to make sure that you can. Um, 
I don't think Mike Perez is on the call, but I'd like to give a shout out to him. And you'll probably recognize some of the contributors of his new book, uh, which will be out March 12th, which is a beautiful tome. I've got my advanced copy to take a peek at and all 412 pages of it. It's beautifully illustrated. And as he says in his introduction, his uh, contributors have more than 300 years experience in uh, combined experience in natural science imaging. So take a look for it. It'll be out on the shelves pretty soon. But here is, for example, uh, four different pictures uh, underwater of this particular specimen, uh, which gets rid of specular highlights. And um, so it's just a, a nice little toy to use. And I use both LED lights and of course fiber optics, but I've really started using uh, LED lights a lot. I really like the quality, the portability, and especially when you're on the road going into museums and things like that, or out in the field, these can operate by electric 110 or obviously battery power, which is really convenient when you're out in the field. And here's just an illustration to show, I'm sure you're all familiar with these types of lighting, uh, one light with a bounce card, but you can really show off the specimen and actually separate. This is a, a seed lily, but if you look at um, image C, you can almost separate the fossil from the matrix if it's lit properly. And just to show you, I also, everything breaks down. I use it as a portable kit, um, depending on what I'm shooting. I find myself using fiber optics less and less and LED lights more and more. You can buy these little, I don't know if anybody uses these. I think they're Lytro, they're rechargeable. I'm not a fan. Uh, you, need a, you need probably six or eight of them if you're gonna use them because the batteries, they go like that. So um, these are just a couple icons. They're fairly inexpensive. Another nice thing about the stage is that with the large platform, I can use a, this is a Nikon focusing stage. Uh, if I wanna do some stitching, I can use this focusing here. Whoops, I wanna go back, sorry about that. Let's see if I can go back. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is just on a small column MP4, which are very rare. Uh, that's the only column that would fit down in my studio. So you can still find them on eBay, but they're fairly expensive. But the whole idea is the flex flexibility of this tilting stage. So I can control the specimen in several different aspects, tilting up and down sideways. And for example, this is one of the pictures done from this. This is a specimen under mineral oil. And this is dinosaur bone. You can see the agatized, another specimen from the Jurassic period, probably about a hundred million years old. But you can see it just this, with the new one of the new Nikon uh, Z72s. And I'm not sure if anybody's tried that out yet, but it also does a very nice job. I, I got to tell you though, the only problem I had with it is getting used to. I'm used to using single lens reflexes with mirrors and I'm sure most of you do. And I constantly, it took me a, a few days to figure out, okay, you don't hit the button twice to lock the mirror up. You just press the button and it makes the shot. So that took old habits die hard. I still every once in a while hit the button twice and try to figure out what I did wrong. Now, this is a picture of most of the as they're called fossil slabs uh, that I photograph. And of course the base of these slabs, they're rocks basically, they're petrified rocks. This for example, is a piece of dinosaur bone and it's hard to tell. You can see right here, this is a lot of quartz. And around here, you can actually see the um, laminar bone as it comes around. So it must've been a fairly large animal. <clears throat> but when you flip it around and this surface has been cut and polished, uh, some of you might have seen this picture. It's amazing uh, the quality you can get. And the only thing that's been done with this specimen, it's been cut on a special diamond saw and polished. So you can see this is chalcedony, but this is again, metaphyseal bone. And you can see some of the bone. I'm sorry, I'm using a mouse and I shouldn't touch that mouse. Metaphyseal bone. And you can also see the quartz up top. And of course, all this is replacement. All these colors are dependent on where the specimen was deposited. 
And there is actually a whole area of science called taphonomy. And it is simply a subset of paleontology, which just, it's the science of what happens to things once they die and are buried in the ground. This is a gomphothere tooth, which was an early elephant type, and it's just showing the dentition, a side cut. This, believe it or not, is a plant called a calamites, which most modern relative is the horsetail. And what you're looking at, this whole red area at the top here is the xylem of the plant, but it's so well preserved down on the bottom, you can still actually see the cell structure, which enabled the plant to live and go through photosynthesis. And I've been photographing a lot of these lately. These are just absolutely spectacular. They're fossil coral and they always remind me of fireworks exploding. They're just so colorful. And of course people, oh, well, what do you do with these? Do you, are you putting Photoshop in this or is this colorized? And no, these are actual colors of these specimens. Of course, some of you might have seen this. This was in the BCA Salon, Aracaroxin Arizonicum. And you can see why they call it rainbow wood, which it's its common name. Some ammonites. Again, these, these are fairly large slabs. But to show you, this is not a fossil at all. This is just an abalone shell. And of course that shell cups like the cup of your hand, but if it's in the right position, uh, you can get the exact depth of field that you need. And many times uh, you can use this without stitching, depending on the magnification. And of course, this is another beautiful sea lily. These things just floated in early seas. This is an opal, believe it or not. They're called Yowa nuts from Australia. Gail might be familiar with these. And they're just beautiful, absolutely beautiful specimens. So that's all I have to say. I'd like to leave you with this quote from the famous paleontologist from Yale, Carl Dunbar. And that is, if they stink, the remains belong to zoology, but if not, paleontology. And that's it. Thank you very much.